But the song is actually about knowing where we've been um, and, and from there, figuring out where to go. Um, and, and we don't really know where we're going to end up. Uh, we, never, we never do, but we do know where we've been. And sometimes that's a really, really good thing to know. So I'm going to talk a little bit today, and this is because it's the second time I've been back with you since the summer, and we're, we're moving into so much change at West Hill that I want to back up and go over some of where we've been, and then invite us to figure out, you know, where we are now and how to move forward from there and what that forward looks like, um, and whether or not we get to write some really great songs about it. Scott, he'll be writing big songs about this, I know. Um, so where have we been? That is a long story uh, and a challenging one in many ways um, because it has, we have uh, taken the history of our congregation um, from your typical United Church congregation flourishing in a new part of the city uh, that was growing and um, making, making uh, homes uh, accessible to people from uh, in the city to move out, have a little bit of space, raise their children, uh, have them educated in new schools with lots of teachers. At one point, I think our congregation had more teachers than anybody else in it, uh, simply because there, was so many, there were so many children who were growing up in Scarborough who were being educated in the new, new school system that started to unfold in the 1950s uh, in Scarborough as it developed. And if you took some time to drive around uh, Scarborough and search out the buildings that are or were United Church buildings, you'd find that very often they're right across the street from, me, from a public school because uh, the idea was that they would be neighborhood churches, just as the school was a neighborhood school. And so the churches didn't need a whole lot of parking because they'd all park in the school parking lot or the playground on Sundays. Uh, and cross the street and go to the United Church in their own neighborhood. But now, if you drove around, you'd see that many of those churches are no longer being used by the United Church of Canada. Many of them have been closed. There are only a handful of them left. When I first came to Scarborough uh, back in 1997, as the minister of West Hill United Church, there were 23 congregations active uh, in the presbytery. And now I think we're down probably to about eight. Uh, maybe seven, uh, and many of them have been amalgamated. But mostly the community has shifted and changed um, over the course of the time. But West Hill shifted and changed in some different ways. We weren't uh, located across the street from a school. Our property was donated to us by uh, Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, her first name isn't recorded on those documents, it being 1950. And uh, so our church got built on the corner of a major street, Kingston Road, uh, the main road coming into the city at that point in time, um, and uh, grew out of the small uh, community that was uh, growing around it, and then that exploded once the bridge over um, the bridge over to the West Rouge area was. Now I'm getting confused about that west or east or, you know, the, bri the bridge. We now have people that live over the bridge and we don't have to go the long way to get to them. So, so that community then became part of the West Hill community as well. And it was, you know, very much a vibrant United Church congregation um, in the place that it was. We had parking. We had people who could drive if they moved away. Um, and we had a vibrant space. In the 1980s, it was so vibrant that uh, the congregation undertook to add extensions on both sides of it. And we have the side that has the lounge and underneath it, uh, the, the nursery and classrooms, and the side with the offices and underneath them, more classrooms. And the center space was a big uh, empty auditorium that could be filled with all kinds of things. The most exciting of which ha happen now are the train wreck. Um, parties that we have down there with Rick and his band. But over the course of the 20 some years after uh, that extension was made, uh, things started to shift in the community around us. And the number of people who were bringing children to the church also shifted. That wasn't something that was happening just to West Hill United Church. That was happening to a lot of churches all the way across the country. Um, United Church uh, congregations were aging. Um, young parents were, were growing as, as their kids left church school, they left the pews. 
Um, the kids didn't come back and the parents didn't really come back except may, may be Christmas and Easter. And so the numbers of, of members in United Churches started to dwindle and the number of people at West Hill started to dwindle and age. But we embarked on something that would um, shift and change that dramatically in the beginning of the, of the millennium. I thought that would look a little more delicate than trying to drink out of this. Um, we took a look at who we were and we decided we wanted to really articulate that clearly. The congregation had uh, been through a series of ministers, uh, some very progressive, some uh, less so. Uh, but as we were beginning to get to know one another in the early 2000s, the congregation really felt that they wanted to put some kind of a stake in the ground to say, you know, we really embrace a lot of contemporary understandings about the Bible, about religion itself, about Christianity. And we want to make sure that we have those embedded in who we are. Um, and so we began this process of writing a statement of faith. We put it on hold for a little while because just as we started it, the entire denomination started the same process. And so we thought we would work through their process as we decided what our statement of faith was going to look like. And we, their process emerged eventually. Uh, and the first draft was a 32 page long statement of faith, which was finally honed down to about 10 pages. And we sent in our submissions about it and studied the previous historical um, statements and, and embraced the new um, song of faith, as it is called, uh, to, in order to help us recognize that it's a metaphorical piece of poetry. And then we returned to our own piece of work, writing a statement of faith. There were 13 people around the table that first night in, in the lounge at West Hill. Uh, some of them are still with us. Some of, some of them have, uh, are no longer with us, have died. Richard Camage was a big part of that conversation early on, and some have um, moved on to other places. Um, but one of the very first things that happened was we started talking about the things that people wanted in the document. And one of the first things that was mentioned was, uh, I, it needs to say that the Bible isn't the authoritative word of God. Yeah, I was okay with that. But someone said, well, we can't say that because there's people in the congregation who believe that the Bible is the word of God. And if you write that down, then they'll feel they're excluded, which was the best thing that could ever have happened because it led us to have a conversation about what a statement of faith is and what it does and what it was we really wanted to have a conversation about. Because what we really didn't want to do was to come up with something that would split the congregation, would say, well, you, you don't belong here because you don't believe this. We have a list of things, and if you don't believe one of those things, you're not here. Which is exactly what Statement of Faith had done since the beginning of the Christian church, uh, since the third, fourth century, when they started coming up with creeds uh, that would identify who was in and who was out. So we had that vibrant conversation. And out of that, we determined that we wanted to talk about how we wanted to live rather than what we should or should not believe. And so we began the work of becoming a congregation that doesn't care what you believe, really. We just want you to try to live a certain way, a way that provides meaning for your life, provides support uh, for the lives of others, that helps us find those values that are positive and life-giving and live them out hard though that is. I remember at the end of the first uh, version of Vision Works being completed after many back and forths with the congregation and the per one of the people who had been on the team said, this is a daunting task. What Vision Works put before us was a daunting undertaking. And we're back in that process of rewriting uh, Vision Works again. This will be the third time it has been rewritten uh, since it was first accepted by the congregation in 2004. Um, and if you want to be part of that conversation, um, let us know. I think Scott's um, undertaking that and putting the team together. But what has that meant for us going forward? It's meant a lot of things. It's meant that the things that were focused predominantly on beliefs that weren't shared by everyone in the congregation ended up being removed from the service. Um, we ended up creating a service that is non-exclusive in terms of uh, theological beliefs. Um, you can believe, you can have a very traditional understanding of Christianity or you could be a, 
a raving atheist. Uh, and you can come into this space and feel um, inspired by what it is that we say and do and think. That's the whole point. Uh, and so we have become a community that is extraordinary, not just um, in Scarborough, but in the United Church and indeed uh, in, in the world. Although there are many secular communities that are figuring out the importance of that as well. So that's a little bit of the story about where we are. Like individuals, communities can become hardened into their definitions of who they are as well. Uh, individuals, um, as the Sue Monk Kid reading says, we all have this steel plate in our head, right? And it's made up of the definitions that other people have given us uh, of who we are, and we've accepted that and we hold on to those definitions. Um, what we've learned uh, and, and what, what we've supposed, uh, but haven't actually opened our minds to see if something is any different. Uh, Scott and I read an article uh, from The Guardian yesterday about how presented with um, the facts about something, if we believe them, if they're affirming what we already know, we will embrace them wholeheartedly. If we don't believe them, if they aren't consistent with what we think uh, the way the world works, then we will come up with all kinds of reasons why they're wrong. Um, and they can be scientifically proven facts. And even those of us who say, well, I only ever, you know, I listen to reason and science and I will still argue that it's not true. And the Guardian pointed that out. So that steel plate is made up of who our parents told us we were, uh, whether we were the smart one or the pretty one or the graceful one or the committed one. Uh, we've got that in our heads and we hang on to that. And we have a, an idea of ourselves in terms of what our teachers taught us. So you can learn this, of course you can, you're good at that or you're never gonna get math. Why don't you just go into, I don't know, ballet. Um, we carry these things in our heads and we hold on to them as def definitions of ourselves and we carry them right straight the way through to our adulthood. And we do that as organizations too. We get entrenched in what we are and how we do things and what it is that is important to us and where it is we are now as opposed to where we could go. And often we see those things as being exactly the same. It takes sometimes a, a traumatic change for us to waken up to the fact that this no longer works. Exxon, no longer on the Dow Jones. Hmm, maybe could have figured that out a few years ago. But no, we were so committed to one way of seeing things that when things start to come apart, we keep patching the holes because no, this worked for us before. Let's just keep up with this. So I want us to now take a moment and I'm gonna take you through just a little bit of a mindfulness process to help us get from where we've been to where we are now. So I want you to settle in where you are. You can close your eyes if you like. Uh, you can hide your video if you don't want somebody seeing you with your eyes closed. And I have to be careful here because there's a, there's a way of having you pay attention to different parts of your body uh, called yoga nidra, which is supposedly back and forth across your brain and puts you right to sleep. So if you fall asleep, just enjoy yourself. But settle down and take a breath. You might be able to feel your heartbeat in your chest. Just pay attention to that for a second. And if you can breathe through your nose, breathe in through your nose and feel the air coming in. And out. Do that a few more times. Pay attention to how the, how the air feels on the way in and the way out. It's cooler on the way in. Warmer on the way out. And you feel your shoulders and just challenge yourself and see if you can drop them down a little bit more. Maybe you're already totally relaxed, but maybe you can drop them just a little bit more. And then think of a place on your body, might be one of those shoulders, could be your elbow or back of your neck. And I want you to just pay attention to that so closely that you can actually feel it. You 
you feel yourself present in that place. I'm going to ask you to go down to the fingers on your left hand. And feel those fingers. Just be attentive to them. And then just take another breath in and a breath out. And open your eyes if they've been closed and just come back to our space. Some people do that every day uh, for a period of time, sometimes up to 45 minutes or an hour. Mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction is a big piece uh, in a lot of people's lives. It helps them cope with uh, emotional and physical challenges. Just becoming aware and the reason that it helps is because it actually fires up places in our brain uh, that can take some of the load off uh, those pain points that are elsewhere. So it's a good practice to do. And it brings us totally into the present, which is the point this morning. We live our lives thinking about what's happened in the past and wondering about what's gonna happen in the future. Sometimes uh, feeling very stressed about what's happened in the past and sometimes feeling very anxious about what's happening in the future. And in the midst of that, we forget that they don't even exist anymore. One is a memory and one is like a possibility. We're right here in this particular second right now and we're actually missing it most of the time because we're back there or not there yet. So what, do, what does being present in this period of time for West Hill mean right now? Uh, what is it we're sitting in? What's our moment of awareness? Well, we're in a different place than we've been in a very ever as a congregation. Um, we were heading towards some very serious financial realities. We'd come out of uh, my review, which was traumatic for all of us. Um, and we were kind of worried about that future and what it was going to look like. We were, we were anxious about that. Still, we uh, hired a, a firm to help us see if there were some ways that we could do some interesting things. And then we brought a few artists in from the community to have them suggest to us what, might, what maybe we could do if we sold the building and gave them a bunch of money. And then uh, a few weeks after that, the Boys and Girls Club walked in and said, hey, we'd like to sell your building and um, you can stay if you want. And the world was suddenly different totally different. We are now sitting in a reality that we didn't, hadn't even imagined um, 12 months ago. It, it wasn't, it was only nine months ago that any of this really came into focus. And so we're sitting in this in-between time and, and uh, like Sue Monk Kid suggests, I think we need to slam our heads down and just let those doors slide open so we can figure out what are some of the ideas out there that are moving around and how might we bring them into our community, into our lives? How can we see ourselves a little bit differently? The story that we've told up until now has been a classic United Church story with a little bit of twist in it. But that little bit of twist didn't do much to change the nature of community as we gathered. Um, in terms of the makeup of the community. We've gathered people from further afield. Um, Mike and Louise Laurie, Mike, the chair of our board, travels an hour and a quarter uh, to come to church um, when we're not in COVID times uh, because of what it is we do and how we speak and the things that we embrace. And many of you are logged in uh, from all different places because of the way we speak and the things that we do. But I want to talk about that place on the corner of Kingston Road and Orchard Park Drive and what it is we do there now. Um, as as uh, someone was saying earlier, we've, the floor is being changed, um, uh, tiles have been put down, uh, new flooring. Uh, there's a ramp that's about to be built. Uh, there's uh, the stained glass, not stained glass, but the colored glass windows in the hall are being 
switched out to, to clear or opaque. I'm not sure, but the color is coming out. Um, all kinds of things are shifting in there. And I think if we walked in and took a whiff of change and not just the glue that the flooring gone down with, we would realize that change is foot in a big way. And we get to experience the thrill of that, um, the, the excitement of that in the moment. Um, as things shift and change, there's, you're never really comfortable, but it's like something's buzzing, right? It's buzzing and something's gonna come out of this and you can feel the buzz and, you know, just sit with it and enjoy it. You can get anxious or afraid or negative or upset. Um, but sitting with that buzz is a moment uh, that we can enjoy. And that's that moment between, I know where I've been, uh, I don't know where I'm going, but I know where I've been. And here's where we have the opportunity to um, figure out maybe what it is that we want to do going forward. And we've done some of that thinking and we've done some of that um, building for tomorrow and we've done, got some ideas. Of those ideas, uh, some of the ones that had coalesced just before the Boys and Girls Club came together and then uh, became a little more exciting in January and February as we actually saw what might happen was the idea of the arts uh, in Scarborough, uh, finding a home in our building in West Hill. Um, that the community around us, out of which some really phenomenal artists have arisen, um, Drake and The Weeknd and Lily Singh, who are all international names. Um, <laughs> most of them started probably in their basements or their apartments. Lily Singh started her YouTube um, channel just in her parents' basement, talking about life. And she's now a media sensation that uh, guides and nurtures uh, young girls and women around the globe with the things that she has out. She, she has a book called How to Be a Boss, B-A-W-S-E, I think is how she spells it. I have the book, I, yeah, I think it's for younger women. But Lily and The Weeknd and Drake all recognize that the, the incredible talent in Scarborough has not really a lot of place to find its way out of Scarborough. And most recently, uh, The weekend has connected with um, the Toronto Dominion Bank to provide support for young creatives in Scarborough uh, to help them find their voices, find their medium, uh, find the way that they can be heard on a world stage. Uh, without having to leave Toronto to do it, um, finding the opportunities right in their own neighborhood to be able to do that. And so West Hill, having begun that conversation um, back uh, last November and carried it on until COVID shut down our being together, uh, who welcomed into our community uh, some of the creatives uh, from Scarborough who were amazing um, and, and shocking even, uh, because we weren't, we didn't know what was going to happen. They just came and, and offered who they were to us. Uh, and we were thrilled, those of us who were present that day. And here's the question for the future. And the, and the song that we're going to play at the end of this is a Gnarls Barkley song. Um, many of you know his song Crazy, which I think we played early on, but this one is, is called Going On. Um, and the idea with Barclay's new song, or his, it's an old song, but is that there's a, there's a portal that will take us to some different thing. And, and the question is, what's that thing? And how much are we willing to risk to get there? And one of the things that, that Barclay, at the beginning of the, of the video, there's some words come up and it says, a group of friends celebrate their discovery of a portal to another dimension. Led by their fearless young leader, they travel to the sacred destination. What lies on the other side, no one knows. Who West Hill will become and how we will be in the future, we don't know. We know who we've been and we can carry on being that, um, a, a community, that is aging and that 
uh, lifts up to the community around it ways that we want to be together, ways that we want humanity to be together, to seek love, to find joy, to uplift one another uh, in our spirits, and, and to do that to the best of our ability, celebrating life as we go along and define it, and finding new opportunities for us to uh, live that life fully uh, for ourselves in ways that honor life, honor the lives of others, celebrate those lives. It's all kind of circuitous, those things. Once, once you think of life as something that it has, has value and dignity that you can offer it, then the challenge to do that becomes um, significant and real. And we start going in the circle of that, making that happen. So we have a community that currently exists. We're connecting to people through Zoom and we can certainly figure out ways to continue to do that once the rest of the community is back in, um, back in the building, whenever that will be. Or we can step outside, uh, Scott says, and. Um, yeah, there's an and, I, it's a challenging and. Um, step outside of that comfort zone of what we have known through that portal into another dimension that isn't currently defined, isn't known, isn't uh, understood completely. And we've talked about that, uh, those of us involved in the leadership team, um, but we haven't talked about that as a community in any big way because we haven't been getting together as a community. And that's another thing about the time that we're in, the present, is that we aren't able to get together as a community and have these conversations, um, except on Zoom. And, you know, when I'm talking on Zoom, if Kevin started talking right now, we'd be going back and forth, the two of us. And I, we wouldn't be hearing both of us the way we would at a table where I'm interrupting and finishing his sentences and then he finishes mine. Well, actually, it's usually me that does the interrupting. But there is a synergy that happens when we're around a table. There's a synergy that happens when we turn around and put our arm on the pew and we talk to the person behind us. There's a synergy that happens when we have guests in our space that we've invited and they live in front of us in ways that are extraordinarily life-changing that help us see uh, differently than we have ever seen before. There's, there's a gift in that, that we open ourselves to. And so, uh, as those who no longer own the building, but are tenants in it, and who have a, a history that we could write and a future that we could imagine, what if we couldn't imagine it? What if it was bigger than what our imagination might hold? What if it was beyond what the description that we could write in a few paragraphs might be able to put in front of us? What if it held a tomorrow that beyond any of us lived outside of what it was we expected? What if we couldn't nail everything down right now and make it perfect? Mary Oliver, uses the image of being in a boat and grabbing those paddles and just making it go, right? Just going in the boat somewhere. You know, you got your idea where you're going. And, and she says, take your hands off the oars. Take your hands off and just sit there and listen for a little bit. Just, just pay attention to what's going on around you, to what's bubbling up in the community beyond our walls, to what's happening around us that might be completely out of whatever we might consider, but is vibrant and alive right now and coming into being. And what if that was part of the noise that we hear, that Mary Oliver says, listen to that. Can you, can you hear that? Listen to that noise. And rather than thinking that sounds a little scary, and turning and making sure the boat headed anywhere, but toward that turbulence, toward that power that's untamed, toward that whatever it is that we are not yet clear on, 
Oliver says, head the boat that way. Go there. That's where life is. And I think that's, I think that's what we need to talk about over the next few weeks, months maybe, I don't know. But we've got time. We've got time to listen, to just sit and listen and to hear what's coming out of the ether around us, the buzz of the world changing, the challenge of our community, not being the community our church was built in anymore, a totally different community, and our needing to find how we choose to be as a community in that world open to the future. Over the next few weeks, um, on that Wednesday afternoon, I'm hoping, we'll be able to come together and have, have conversations, just open conversations, uh, intentional conversations about that roar we can hear in the distance and what it would look like if we started, started heading toward it, rowing toward it instead of away from it. What it would cost us and where it would take us and whether that's the right thing to do or if we just don't have the energy anymore which is an absolutely legitimate decision to make. But I think we need to get close enough to the roar to really understand what it might offer and challenge and be before we decide we can't go there. Some of the words of the Barclay song that you're going to listen to in a, in a minute are anyone that he, he says, to do what I want and do what I please is first on my list. But before that, and, and he's explaining his position by those words, anyone that needs what they want and doesn't want what they need, I want nothing to do with. So he's saying, if, if you want something and you want you just want, it's not something you need, you want it, and you make that the focus of your life. And I don't really want to spend time with you, he says. I that's not life, according to him. It's when, it's when we know what it is we need, and we find ways to make that happen. If we look around us, and we look at the community in which we're situated, and we were thinking not simply what we want, as part of that community, but what we need and what that community needs, where does that take us? There's some sort of psychedelic artistry in the, in the video that you're going to watch, which is a bit, you know, silly. But the, the story of the song is that we need to know, we need to find out what the possibilities are. We might even wanna go there and, and stay there um, or go there and come back. But not knowing is simply not an option for us. At least it's not an option I think we should take. I think we need to know. And so when you get an invitation to be part of that conversation, whether you're in Africa or in the Southern States or if you're out West uh, or if you're here in Scarborough, I want you to be part of that conversation because it's a conversation about how we can impact our own world around us and how the impact of that world as West Hills impact has always been can have waves that go out beyond who we are and change so much more than we will ever touch. So Peter, I'll turn it over to you and Gnarls Barkley and we'll have the luxury of leaving where we are without even leaving at all. <laughs>